Video games aren't known for dwelling on death all that much. Death is typically nothing more than a mechanic, it's just a punishment, a means of incentivizing the player to self-improve. Death is impermanent, you aren't encouraged to think about it, it's just a frustrating roadblock between you and victory. Even in the most ruthless games, where death is especially frequent, the impermanence of it is almost comical. Think of something like Hades or Dark Souls, where death is both inevitable and, eventually, easy to shrug off. But in that sense, I think it makes it all the more special when a game actually does explore such concepts in depth. For a medium in which death is everywhere, it's almost surprising that we aren't encouraged to think about it more often. Death is the most universal theme there is. We all experience loss, we all experience mourning, and as much as we try not to think about it, we're all going to die, eventually. I can sense that some viewers might start to feel a bit uncomfortable at that thought. It's alright, that's probably a sign you're still sane. These are, after all, extremely difficult things to think about. Where do we even begin? How do we even contemplate the impermanence of our physical bodies? The questions and speculations around death go on forever. Maybe it's just me, but I actually find it weirdly comforting if a piece of media is able to bring me a sense of closure over these ideas. Not just because we're all going to kick the bucket eventually, and one way or another we have to make sense of that, but because we're surrounded by death all our lives. People die, constantly. Friends, family, pets. And it does us good to make peace with that. That's why I'd like to talk to you about Spiritfarer, developed by Thunder Lotus Games. Spiritfarer isn't just a great game. It's a masterpiece of storytelling that finds a way to profoundly and gently teach us about death. It provides a safe but deeply emotional platform with which to come closer to these ideas than I think any other piece of media has ever, and in a way that only a video game can. This is Curmudgeon Media, my name's Tom, and together, you and me are going to talk about Spiritfarer. Thunder Lotus are, by their own self-admission, a game studio who are obsessed with death. Their first game, Jotun, released in 2015, throws us headfirst into a Norse hero's quest into the afterlife. In their follow-up game, Sundered, released in 2017, the protagonist never dies. As two punishingly difficult, action-oriented games, their musings on death remain very much within the realm of violence, fantasy, and adventure. After all, in the words of lead writer Nicholas Guerin, you have so many constraints and criteria to deal with in game development, so many hurdles. In that sense, games are so often taxed by the fact that they still have to be fun. In many ways, the action and adventure of Jotun and Sundered, no matter how macabre, is always at the forefront of the player's mind, rather than the pervasive theme of death. And to me, that means there's only so close they can get to capturing the authentic lived experience of loss, mourning, and death. This isn't a criticism, of course. Fundamentally, they aren't designed to be that way. Spiritfarer, released in 2020, is designed to be that way. In fact, to its very core, Spiritfarer couldn't be more of a stark departure from Thunder Lotus's previous games, on a mechanical level and a thematic one, but we'll get to that in a mo. Inspired in part by Greek mythology, Spiritfarer takes place on the River Styx, here imagined as a vast ocean rather than a river, upon which Charon the Boatman would transport the dead into the afterlife. You play as Stella, who wakes up on the Styx with her feline companion, Daffodil. Greeted by Charon himself when you start the game, he confers onto you the title of Spiritfarer. In his place, it's now your responsibility to shuttle wayward spirits onto the great beyond. These wayward spirits manifest their inner selves in the form of animals. Unlike Jotun or Sundered, death in Spiritfarer isn't something that you fight for or wrestle with in a literal sense. As Thunder Lotus marketing director Rodrigue Duperon would have it, the game is about dying but not about killing, and more about coming to terms with death. Hauling passengers to and fro atop your boat, you take care of them until they're ready to pass on, and eventually until you're ready to pass on. As such, the game is a blend of farming and resource management simulation, set upon a vast, beautiful side-scrolling open world. Throw in a healthy dose of palliative care layered throughout, and you've got Spiritfarer. As you take on spirits, you cook for them, build for them, keep them happy and content, and so on. Unlike many other farming or resource management sims, Spiritfarer is heavily story-driven, a portmanteau of moving vignettes, woven together out of people's life stories. If this sounds like something you'd enjoy, then it probably is. 
So if you haven't played Spiritfarer, I would encourage you to go and do that, because this video is going to be spoiler heavy from here on out. To my eye, a lot of the dialogue around Spiritfarer focuses on the letting go part of dying, whether that be letting go of someone you love, or letting go of the world and going quietly into that good night or, you know, whatever they say. This is super important of course, but I also think it neglects to touch upon the other part of that idea. That is, what it is we'd be letting go of. There's a song in Spiritfarer simply titled, What Will You Leave Behind? And I took that to be something of a mantra for the whole game. From beginning to end, the question of what we leave behind in the process of death is a frequent one. When spirits die, they leave a unique flower in their wake, which is a literal and figurative representation of what they leave behind. As you collect these spirit flowers, the foliage on your ship spreads, and as your boat becomes increasingly abloom with flowers, it eventually gestures you into the endgame, your own passing. In a sense, whatever it is these spirits left behind gradually prepared you for death. But this idea of what we leave behind is manifested physically in more ways than one, and in a manner that marries with the central gameplay loop in crucial ways. For example, almost every passenger encourages you to build a facility of some kind, like a loom, or a sawmill, or a foundry. Moreover, they actually teach you how to use them properly, tutorialising you in the central functions of the game, while also building an inextricable emotional connection between said function and themselves. That is to say, it's not just a loom, it's Gwen's loom. That's not just an orchard, that's Alice's orchard. And that's not just a sawmill, that's Atul's sawmill. He asked you to build it, he showed you how to use it. To add to this, if you look after the spirits properly, they'll casually use these facilities in the background, sawing wood and doing work of their own accord so you don't have to. The game is encouraging the player to build a mental connection between a character and a central gameplay function that you'll be returning to throughout, even after they've gone. And that's the crucial part right there. Even after they've gone. You go on this whole emotional journey with a person, but they remain because they've left behind a part of themselves in the form of a simple facility on your ship. This is a part of what makes Spiritfarer such a stroke of genius, the way it interweaves its mechanics and its themes in a meaningful and identifiable way. Nicholas Guerin once also stated that games are an art form and we can express things through games that only games can express. This is a great example. The central mechanics of the game are used in a way that simulates memory, and the intricate codex of associations that we build throughout our lives as we meet people and they become permanent fittings in our brain. But it doesn't stop there. Your ship is more than just a place for facilities and tools. It's a home. Every spirit needs a house, specific to them and unique to their tastes, both functional and a cosmetic depiction of who they are as individuals, what they like, what their priorities are, and so on. If you've played the game, you know the rhythm of it. You begin to amass a few passengers and facilities, and in those early hours of gameplay the space on your ship starts to get a little tight. You don't have enough limbs, the in-game currency, to buy a bigger boat just yet, so you make do. Then you take your first passenger to the Everdor. You give your tearful goodbye, but you think to yourself, at least I'll be able to salvage their home for parts and make more room for future passengers. And that's when you realise you can't. You can salvage any building for parts, except the spirits' homes. The game simply doesn't allow you to, and that's not accidental, nor is it just to frustrate you. Their houses are too personal to just throw away, and thus they remain permanent fixtures on your ship, and along with their spirit flower, they're a symbol of the permanent mark they leave on your heart. And so, as you progress through the game and your boat gets larger and expands, you gradually accumulate the houses of people you've known and loved throughout your journey. One by one, they leave behind this physical part of themselves. The ship itself begins to resemble a portrait of all the connections that we make in life, and how they carry us through it all. But the houses are a really interesting one, because there's one noticeable factor that sets them apart from the facility. That is, they don't do anything. They're just empty shells of friends and family. This is where the idea of what we leave behind becomes a bit more nebulous. I mean, yes, there are physical things that get left behind, but they also leave behind nothing at all. A void. I mean, that's what these houses are, right? They're empty. They're more so a reminder of what's not there than what is. A constant echo of what used to be, always in the back of your mind as you play. Characters live on through their absence. And that's when you really start to experience that feeling of loss and mourning. 
You begin to notice what's missing. A tool doesn't bring you timber anymore, summer isn't there to help tend to your garden. Gustave's lively violin is gone, and all that's left is a tombstone of a house that never goes away. It's difficult to talk about this aspect of the game without taking a closer look at the spirit's personalities and how they're actually written as characters. I don't want to bore you by doing a deep dive of every single passenger, and I don't think it's necessary either. Instead, all I want to do is take a closer look at one specific character who affected me the most, their story, and divulge the unique aspects of their character whose absence I noticed most prominently. Atul is Stella's biological uncle and one of the first passengers you encounter in the entire game. A naturally energetic, kind-hearted, and amicable man, Atul leaves a mark from the second he appears on screen. He's a great example of something this game does very well, giving the impression that you've known this character your whole life, even though as a player, you've only just met them. He's animated with this infectious boisterousness as he bounds around the ship, fixing things and doling out the best hugs ever put to animation. He almost seems to make it his personal mission to make your life as Spiritfarer as easygoing as possible. He'll upgrade stuff for you, he's always seen fixing things around the ship, and he'll eat pretty much anything you put in front of him, making it easier on you to focus on the pickier eaters among the crew. In fact, he eats a lot, and the easiest way to his heart is through his stomach, something demonstrated by the fact that a large number of his quests are food-related, and have you travelling all over the map to cook special meals for him. But even if you take your time gathering these meals for him, he never complains. One of my favourite things about him is that he'll play his flute in the middle of a rainstorm. He's just so… pleasant. You'd be forgiven for thinking he was an optimist at heart. But as you spend more time with him, it doesn't take long before Atul proves to be his own worst enemy. His brain quickly takes him down darker emotional paths that sour his mood and make his day-to-day -day living… difficult. It doesn't matter what you do for him, the food you cook, the tasks you complete, there's a hole in his heart that simply can't be filled. There's nothing you, or anyone else, can do about that. As you progress through his story, Atul will eventually propose that you do a big, family-style dinner for yourself and a handful of your favourite passengers. You prepare the food, you find a venue, and Atul does a toast. He thanks everyone for making him feel like part of a family. He thanks you. It zooms out and fades. When you wake up the following morning, you realise that Atul isn't there. My first thought was that I'd left him at the dinner somehow, but nope. The other passengers say that they don't think he's coming back. You go to his room, and there it is. His spirit flower. Atul's disappearance in-game corresponds to his story in life. One day, he just disappeared without a trace. The implication in this case is suicide. Some passengers died of cancer or old age, but Atul clearly had depression. And eventually, he lost that fight. This devastated me when I played Spiritfarer for the first time. Atul was my favourite passenger. I was looking forward to bringing him closure, I was looking forward to those last few thoughts he'd share with me before the Everdor. All those things about him that I loved suddenly weren't there anymore. No hugs, no playing the flute in the rain, the banging of his hammer as he'd fix stuff around the ship, it all just disappears. The game creates this beautiful portrait of its passengers, to the degree that a sizeable hole is left behind when they're gone. And this stuff becomes all the more noticeable when you start getting to the late game and the more… difficult passengers. Bruce and Mickey are everything that Atul isn't. Well, Bruce is anyway. Rude, arrogant, obnoxious, demanding, they're picky with food and they insult you if you give them something they don't like. At that point, you really start to miss Atul and his presence around the boat. Bruce and Mickey are interesting, tragic characters in their own right, but after they passed on, I was honestly relieved to be free of the constant demands and beratement. And then it hits you. What we leave behind, it's more than just physical, and it's more than just absence. We leave behind memories, we leave behind a legacy. You miss a tool because of how he treated you, because of the person he was, because of how he made you feel. The same can't be said of Bruce and Mickey. So the game kind of asks you, what will you leave behind? Stella was, in life, a palliative nurse. Throughout the game, you discover exactly the kind of person that she was, and exactly the kind of legacy she left behind. Even in the face of complicated and messy patients like Bruce and Mickey, she's completely unflinching in her love and kindness. The connections she makes are a sign of the positive impact she had on the world around her. And because of that, those connections stay with her until the very end. Your friends' souls turn into constellations that light up the sky. 
They guide you in the same way that sailors once upon a time would use the stars to navigate. And, when you're finally ready to depart, they're with you. Stella's last voyage to the Everdor is painfully quiet. But when you watch her ascend and you see all those faces stretched out between the stars, it doesn't feel quite so lonely or scary. It's fitting that the last words you hear in the entire game are, my friend. So I guess that's what we leave behind, if we can. And I don't know about you, but I guess I take some comfort in that. Thanks for watching, guys. Whew, that was a heavy one, huh? Quick announcement, as many of you may already know, Curmudgeon Media is on Ko-fi now. We're open to one-off donations as well as tiered subscriptions with rewards and stuff, ranging from early access to videos, all the way up to videos based on topics of your choice. If you want to help support the channel, that's the best way to do it, and any help at all is super appreciated. Anyway, that's all from me, so I'll see you all in the next video.